I would be someone who didn't uh, get politics from above, you know, and by saying that I mean at university or reading books. Uh, I, 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 way, way, I got interested in politics, I suppose I joined the, the Northern Ireland Labour Party, the Derry Labour Party, which was associated with the Northern Ireland Labour Party, the Northern Ireland Labour Party in turn being associated with the British Labour Party. And we had a very good Derry Labour Party. It was called the London Derry Labour Party. And it was um, it was very well attended. It was very vibrant. It was very busy. It was full of people, full of commitment about Derry and about politics. Uh, there was a sort of liberal people in it and there was left people in it like myself and Willie Breslin, Charlie Morrison, Brandon Hines. And... Uh, it was the left and it were fairly radical, you know, in terms of what they said and things they did. And the Derry Labour Party was also, Ivan Cooper was also in it. Ivan was a very vibrant member of it. He was probably the most well-known member of it because his background was very interesting. Uh, he was very concerned about housing in Derry and very concerned basically about Derry and uh, the politics of it. He. He was born in Killaloo, as you know, being a Protestant, used to be associated with the Unionist Party in some way or another. But I met Ivan a way back when we were very young, when we were about 13 years of age. And I lived in Wellington Street in the bog side, just beside Free Dairy Corner. And Ivan and I would have played for the same football team, so we spent a lot of time in the bog side and people got to know him. He was very outspoken. He was, he was He's a very honest fellow, and he, he, you know, he talked about housing, and he was a very public faced man, you know, and um, so that's when I got the new wave, and so wave was also in the Derry Labour Party, and that was, I think, the Derry Labour Party was going on from about nineteen sixty three, sixty four. But I lived in number seven Wellington Street down the bog, uh, beside Free Derry Corner, under Jarvis and Free Derry Corner. My father was a cattle drover. I'm telling you this because that's why I got into politics, or interested in politics. And uh, my father was a cattle drover, worked very hard. Myself, my mother, my two sisters, for us. He he suffered bronchitis all his life. The house that we lived in was um, awful state, damp. If you touched the wallpaper, you got an electric shock, you know. Um, of course, like everyone else in the town, we kept hoping all the time we would get a house, but there was no house built at that time. My father would have worked with a man called Dr. Abernethy. He would have looked, my father was very good with animals. He would have looked after Abernethy's, some of Abernethy's animals. He was got on well with animals. And uh, Abernethy, Dr. Abernethy felt the world of him. Now interestingly, Dr. Abernethy was a medical officer of health in Derry. He was also in charge of the Apprentice Boys in Derry. Uh, a big named Unionist, a big big Unionist man in the town. And uh, when my father died at 52, 54 years of age, that was about 1963, uh, the first person to come to my home was Dr. Abernethy. And interestingly, the second person to come was Ivan. But my father died, yeah, and um, that was shocking like it is for anyone. And uh, I remember thinking that living in that house all those years didn't do him a lot of good because of his bronchitis and his general bad health. And I got very, very angry at the thought of it. And I remember when Dr. Abernethy came to the house, uh, he came in and he sat down, my mother had tea, etc., and then he was leaving, we all left him to the door, as he did in those days. Family left the visitor to the door. He said to my mother, Mrs. McClanahan, I'll get you a house now. And my mother said to him, but your Dr. Abernethy, it's too late, Jimmy's dead. I've never forgotten, I've never forgotten that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember being very, very angry about it, you know, when it never left me that moment. And that's why I got involved in politics. Uh, no big deal, that was the reason. That's what I meant by saying that I got politics from my surroundings rather than from right. above, you know. 
and uh, I was at that time they were redeveloping, and then a few years later they started redeveloping the bauxite redevelopment area, which of course the redevelopment was associated with the fact that they didn't want to extend the boundaries because that would have interfered with the voting pattern, mm. which was very unfair and gerrymandered in Derry. So they were building upwards as the high flats evidenced by the high flats. And uh, I believe it, a lot of people don't realise that at that time there was plans to build high flats over around the Brandywell area and a lot around the Lone Moor area. It never materialised that because of the uh, troubles. But I was very upset at that time between one thing and another and I was a member of the Labour Party, the good party at that time. And I I would uh, complain about the, about the, the, the condition of the bogside around Wellington Street, uh, where there was walls that were half knocked down, half built, children were falling off and etc. And I would uh, complain about this all the time, uh, about, the, about the, the state of the place, to the extent that I used to block streets, and would block streets and would do this. At the same time, I was always advocating for someone who was looking for houses. Mm -hmm. So I'd be never out of the housing executive office. There was one at the top of Fawn Street at the time, and I was in and out of that practically daily. Were you part of a group? Hmm? Was that part of a, 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 that was, a group? Was that the Dairy yeah. Housing Action Committee? No, that was before that. This was just part of the Dairy Labour Party. Right. And, uh, and I, I was agitating right, left and centre. And... Um, that was during the, uh, and then the Dairy Housing Action Committee sprung up along with the Dairy Unemployed Action Committee. So there was three sort of radical entities in Dairy at that time. There was the Dairy Labour, the after the Dairy Labour Party, the Housing Action Committee and the Dairy Unemployed Committee. And uh, we had a lot in common because of what we were doing. And uh, in, 19, in March 1963, uh, no, sorry, March 1968, Eamon uh, McCann came back from London and we, uh, Eamon came in to see me and we chatted and uh, he writes this in his, that book you mentioned, but uh, he, he, said he, he said in the book he only came over for his sister's wedding, I think, but he, I, he, he, I asked him to go to a meeting at the weekend and he stayed for it. And uh, when Eamon arrived, he joined the Dairy Labour Party because that was the only place for him, really. And he, um, he, he, he influenced great change. He had an urgency about him uh, that no one else had. He had an urgency about him. He had an internationalist perspective. And as I've written in that article I told we talked about, you know, he, he sort of dislodged the sort of liberals in the Dairy Labour Party, made them feel uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, it was just, I suppose, to some extent, in a, a, a sort of thinking in, in, in modern terms about left-wing politics, etc. It's also a Trotskyist. He had also been very much involved in the anti-Vietnam movement in London. He was very prominent in that, very articulate and very, very urgent, wanted things done immediately and uh, had a tremendous influence in that whole sort of radical scene in Derry, you know. And um, as I said, you know, the Thousand Action Committee, the Derry left the Labour Party and uh, and the, uh, the Unemployed Action Committee, uh, we would get together and do some demonstrations together. That became a very radical movement in the town. And uh, to the extent that it it sidelined constitutional politics, like the Nationalist Party. Mm. The Nationalist Party had been uh, the, 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 the sort of people in Derry who were speaking up for the city and speaking up about nationalism, about discrimination, about the lack of housing, about the lack of jobs, but they weren't doing it in a radical way. Mm. It was more sort of talk rather than action. And. Uh, uh, Eddie McAteer, who, who, who they formed the official opposition against the Unionists of Stormont at one stage. Eddie, Eddie McAteer was a very good man, but very conservative in ways. You know, he didn't wasn't a very radical person in terms of action. Nevertheless, uh, he was very well respected. 
But the prominent members of that radical group like McCann and uh, myself and Eamon Malak and Van Barrow Doherty and uh, at just before that sort of period also I would squatted a lot of people into houses. I actually had my own housing list and Wooly Breslin or somebody would phone me up or Charlie Morris and I'd say there's an empty house in such and such a street and immediately I would go and get a family and move them in. And we would have sort of handyman with us and a plumber or a, mm. whatever we needed to get the people settled. Uh, I made a few mistakes, mind you, because I put people in houses that weren't really vacated, but that was that was uh, what happened sometimes to, to my embarrassment. But that was the sort of activity we were doing, and uh, we, with Charlie Morrison and Woolley and I, we had a we had a. a all we needed to, to, to put someone in a house to fix it up, etc. Um, but anyway, and that so that was the sort of activity was going on. And constitutional politics were completely and totally uh, sidelined, and uh, because we were actually taking direct action, that was the difference, wasn't it? We were taking direct action. If we didn't like something, we did something about it. Whereas you know, with constitutional politics discussed it, brought it up mm -hmm. at meetings, took it. it you were um, more immediate? We were more immediate, mm. that's right. And um, that was the sort of stuff we were at, you know. And uh, I remember then uh, they were causing a lot of disruption in the town, you know. There's so much to talk about in those days when you think about it, about, you know, squatting and we were forming tenants associations also. We were getting ordinary people involved in their political life and the politics. That was. Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, we were busy as bees, you know, and, uh, McCann once, and, uh, there was a, there was a, there was people in the Guildhall, families in the Guildhall occupying the Guildhalls and that for protesting about housing. And Eamon and Malak, uh, I remember Eamon Malak saying to Eamon McCann, yeah, well, I'll phone up the housing, like the, the civil rights people in the morning, and we'll arrange a march, see if they'll arrange a civil rights march for Derry, and that's, why the 5th of October happened. A lot of people were very dubious about the 5th of October march because it was organised by the radical element, mm -hmm. you know. And you may be radical and responsible, but nevertheless, there's a large number of people who think if you're radical that you're irresponsible by definition, you know. Mm -hmm. And that there's a certain amount of truth. <laughs> but um, the responsibility in that sense is probably initiative. And... Um, uh, you know what happened the 5th of October, the state arrived and under the, the uh, Bill Craig ordered the police in and uh, we were we were beaten under the ground, basically. You know, we've seen footage of it, I suppose. We were beaten under the ground, but that wasn't just a reflection of what the police felt should have been done that day. It was really sort of beaten nationalists and back into their place. You know, that's, that's what that was about, you know. Uh, just remember who you are, sort of thing, you know, because... Um, and um, the, 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 the Northern Ireland, by its very nature, and the nature of the state means if you do anything, um, you're either anti-Protestant, you're anti. If you do anything to help, you're anti, you're anti-Protestant. Mm. You're defined as anti-Protestant. That's because of the nature of the state. And of course, you know as well as I do, this is nonsense, you know. But the fifth of October happened, and. Um, I remember Eamon and I coming back, uh, I remember John Hume and I uh, lifting, and Eamon will have lifting the, the injured into Cassoni's Cafe, which was just at the end of the bridge there, and putting them on tables until the ambulances arrived for them. But I remember Eamon McCann and I coming back into the bog site, um, and there was a riot at the top of Fawn Street. Was, that, this was something we hadn't seen before. It's not, uh, you know, I, had, I certainly hadn't seen anything like it before. It was remarkable, and uh, this, of course, was the culmination of the way people felt over time. It just wasn't because of the march or because of the violence. It had a lot to do with that, written off, you know. But, but um, you know, I remember, and I mentioned it before. You know, when John Steinbeck actually came, he was a Nobel, a, a Littler's here for Nobel, you know, prize winner. But he. 
he was in the box right away back in 1952. And he wrote for a magazine when he went back to America about that area. And he said there's going to be, I can't remember the exact words, but what he meant was that there's going to be, there's going to be trouble here soon. Mm. He just knew by looking at people, you know, by looking at the area and by looking at people's faces. As I said in the thing, you know, he knew something, these people felt that something had been stolen from them, and it's true. And, you know, from my experience also living in Wellington Street, you know, growing up, people just kept going to England to look for jobs, you know. Uh, job seeking just disintegrated the communities in Derry, you know, and you could see all this, and this, this was all happening and building up over the years. But after the 5th of October March, I have to honestly say that um, I think that the radical group, who were desperate by, desperate by definition before that, mm -hmm. because they had all come together from different groups and different, there was, they, they were a desperate group in that sense. And there was no common sort of philosophy to sort of pull them together mm. or that, that would have enabled them to have a philosophy about this or a strategy about that or a plan to do this or do that or do the other thing. Um, Gavin, so when the 5th of October happened, everything happened so quickly and the situation turned so quickly that we felt it difficult to deal with. I certainly felt it difficult to deal with because now it was sort of, you know, you, you, you one day you were sort of having a march and the next day you were world news. Mm -hmm. And the press were coming from all around the place, from everywhere. And I, I certainly found it difficult to sort of cope with that and what we should do, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And at the risk of, um, I mean, I just think that a lot of people, uh, uh, there a lot of the radicals at the time felt exactly the same way. They were sort of disarmed. All of so bad. About, I think it was three or four days after the 5th of October then, there was a march called by, nobody knows who called it, uh, there were about 30 or 40, 50 people turned up at the City Hotel, John Hume and Michael Canavan and um, people who were well known in the community, Stephen McGonigal who was an independent labour man for years and years and years and who had fought elections in Derry against the nationalists. And everybody sort of turned up. And uh, we had a dis problem with that. What were we to do, you know? Were we to ignore it, the radicals? Uh, or were we, what were we to do? We didn't quite know. But we did feel that uh, all of a sudden people are arriving now to sort of uh, associate themselves with uh, us. Mm -hmm. And that before that, many of them would have thought that uh, what we were doing and the tactics that we employed were just totally foreign to them. They wouldn't have agreed with it. They would have said, you know, they're irresponsible, they're radicals, they're, you know. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden, you know, Eamon McCann was very annoyed, I was very annoyed, everybody was annoyed, Willie Breslin, Johnny White was also very prominent at that time and um, didn't quite know what to do. I had very mixed feelings about it. Eamon McCann was, uh, that's when he came out with that phrase, they're all middle-aged, middle-class and middle of the road. It's very understandable when you think about it, his anger and his peak, because uh, well, I can certainly understand it, but um, nevertheless we didn't quite know what to do. Eamon sort of said what we should do is we should, uh, okay, we'll agree to go to the meeting, but we will not have anything uh, anything there to, uh, to, 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 to guide us or bind us to it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. Mm. We did go to the meeting and I, Eamon shared it and I was secretary and Johnny White was the flank Eamon on the other side and uh, there, was an elect, there was a citizens action committee elected, 16 people. I was elected. Uh, well, th th there was a, an understanding that the, orig the original organisers would be automatically put and would be members of it. After the meeting, Eamon was very upset. A lot of people were upset. I was upset. Now, I, uh, Eamon and I talked, and Willie Breston and Charlie and Morrison and Johnny, everyone talked about this, and uh, I was worried that, you know, if we decided not to come into it, that we'd either be sort of accused of not understanding the gravity of the situation that was happening at that time, or that we were being elitist, 
or that we were huffing or that we were, you know, and that uh, maybe people might have thought that what is, what is needed is a very broad-based committee anyway, and a, a larger broad-based committee. And let's face it, some of the uh, people who were elected onto it, who proposed and elected onto it, were very well-known citizens and respected, if you forgive me for saying it, by the liberal classes, you know, that sort of way. But um, I can understand, Eamon in particular, I can understand Eamon's anger at it. And uh, Eamon was also thinking of politics, left-wing politics. He said if we don't associate ourselves with them, they won't have any, uh, they won't have any uh, legitimacy whatsoever. Mm. I wasn't sure about that. A lot of people weren't sure about it. I would have uh, not sure about it at all. And uh, given the fact that these were sort of well-known citizens and, you know, unlike people like myself, who, who was the street radical. And um, and then there was all sorts of arguments. One other person, somebody else would say, well, sure, we'll go in there and we'll try and influence it, you know. Uh, but Eamon, Eamon, Eamon very understandably sort of disconnected himself from it. And that's the story of the origins of the Citizens Action Committee. Mm. And as I had written about before, the, when we went into the meetings, we found it very difficult to have any say whatsoever, you know, because we were used sort of coming up with radical ideas. We were just mm. responding to a situation that needed responding to immediately, you know. Mm. Uh, and we could do that because we weren't an organised group. We didn't have to go through any protocol. We didn't have to have emotions and voting that we could do this. We just did it. You know, I mean, I remember if if something if if if, if I had heard that uh, a, a a a resident was being treated badly by a, a landlord, I didn't have to go to a meeting to discuss this. I just went and sorted it out and got very angry and did what I had to do to sort it out. You know, and there was many occasions when that happened. Uh, so sitting in the Citizens Action Committee with all this reasoned logic and reasonable approach and that. We, we, we had very little influence, very little influence, you know. But um, that's what happened at that time. And then, then the, 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 the Citizens Action Committee, of course, had thousands and thousands of people on the street and marched here and marched there, which is part of history now, and, had a, and were very powerful, very powerful, you know. And if you think about the... You know the legacy of the civil rights movement, and that uh, after nineteen sixty nine, between nineteen sixty nine and seventy, there was three and a half thousand houses built in Derry. You know, mm. if you look at what happened for from nineteen sixty nine, January nineteen sixty nine to August nineteen sixty nine, the Battle of the Box, uh, there was a lot of reforms. The Derry Corporation was abolished. The Morton Commission took over, so democracy was restored to some extent with the corporation being abolished. William Craig was either sacked or resigned. I can't remember. I think he was sacked. Uh, the PD march started on the 1st of January, wasn't it? Yeah, the 1st of January, 1969. March to Derry, and you know the situation where that was. They were attacked everywhere they went, especially at Burnt Holiday at the road here. And uh, and there was riots in Derry when they arrived from Derry. There was riots for three or four days after that. Quite awful riots. And that's the time when the police come into the box side and abuse people physically terribly, you know, and beat people up and just wrecked houses, etc., etc. And all that is mounting up, and um, <coughs> and then and then uh, uh, Paisley was becoming very prominent at that time also, and he, Lord O'Neill, Terence O'Neill, was sort of seen as a liberal man. Any sort of small reforms that he tried to push through, Paisley would disagree, etc., etc. And uh, so he resigned, and then Lord Chichester Clark, James Chichester Clark became. He was just a big country man, you know, a big winning in the politics. And some of the statements he came out, they were quite ridiculous. You know, he was saying things like, Catholics in Belfast are burning their own houses down, you know. <laughs> and uh, at, at one stage, the, the people from the Citizens Action Committee went up to meet him. He looked as if he just didn't understand what was happening at all, at the seriousness of the situation. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, and uh, 
as I say, there was you know there was lots of reforms happening, and then the beast vessels were also uh, abolished at that time between Christmas and uh, between New Year and August of '69. And lots of other things happened, and there, there were certain reform measures put in place, but it was all too little, too late, you know. And then, of course, uh, that, that, that all those, yeah, and there was sort of, uh, 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 it was, I think, March in 1969, I think it was March, as far as I can remember, you know. There were civil rights marches everywhere in the north of Ireland. There was about 20 civil rights marches in Derry. Everybody marched, dockers marched, factory cars marched, marched you know. And the police could do absolutely nothing to stop it. There, it was, uh, it was, from their point of view, it was an, anar anarchical. You know, it was just anarchy all in the streets. But uh, people marched with, with with pride and with discipline, and uh, most of the time. Uh, so there was that. What was happening in '69? Then there was a, there was there was some reform measures got through, like I mentioned. There was a, 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 but, but as I say, everything happened too late, you know. D Derry, for instance, as usual, got nothing mm. uh, in terms of economic development or economic infrastructure. Nothing like that happened in Derry, you know. So there was always going to be that discontent in Derry. Is that know? because it was nationalist? Yes, nationalist. Yeah, in, that, in, the, in the book, you, t you, you said um, fistless unionists you know, conspired to do that, to make sure Derry got nothing? Well, there was, there was a 19, uh, a 19, let me see, no, 1967, wasn't it? 1968, the Derry Labour Party, 1967, the Derry Labour Party put up 16 candidates to fight local government elections and actually got one third of the vote, or just slightly less than one third of the vote, but because of contrary arithmetic, they didn't get anybody in the council. But also in 1966, was it, I think, I remember Ivan Cooper and I walking around the whole waterside area with a petition trying to get signatures to get the university to Derry. And of course, the Lockwood Committee for Adult, for adult Education, uh, for, for further education, it, uh, the university went to Clarine, which was ridiculous. And that, that was dreadful, that festered, you know, in people in Derry and upset them very much. And, uh, you know, if ever there was an ideal place for a university, I think Derry was, was at, you know, and, uh, you know, with its history and with its, you know, with the university, the, the, it could have been the embryo for the university, etc., etc., all that stuff. But it never, they never got the university and uh, that created, that was very, very damaging to the people of Derry, never, for, never forgiven. No, I don't think people still, that's still noise people. Still, mm -hmm. and uh, even to this very day, I mean, they settled two years ago, they were going to sort of expand McGee University, still hasn't happened, you know. And uh, I, I, that's when I wrote that thing, I, I just felt that uh, that young people should know the experience of day. Not just young Catholic people and nationalist mm -hmm. people, but young Unionist people too should also realise what happened to Derry. I mean, the fact of the matter is, some Unionist the faceless men actually voted or were against the university coming to Derry, just as sort of spite nationalism mm -hmm. or Catholicism or whatever way they looked mm -hmm. at the world, you know. But uh, it was unforgivable. You know, it was unforgivable. And of course, at that time there was the the big motorcade to Belfast, where right? twenty thousand people went to Belfast, but. Uh, effect whatsoever because the mind was made up. Mm -hmm. um, I would have assumed that Lockwood Lockwood was a was an Englishman. I don't know. I think the guy that was in charge of the Lockwood, you know, the port and education, and that put the university in cool rain. And uh, the influence in him must have been quite powerful in ways, you know. But that was always the way. Um, the you know, it's interesting too when you look back, you know, talk about the the, the, the effect of all this afterwards. What's the word you use? The legacy. Legacy, yeah. yeah. You know, it, the civil rights movement, even to this very day, is affecting politics on the street here. Mm. It, it really does. It, 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 it liberalised people's minds, nationalist people in the north of Ireland. It had a tremendous effect, that whole civil rights movement, mm. in a sense. Now, Interestingly enough, all civil rights were doing was looking for sort of citizenship rights, you know. Mm. It wasn't sort of dealing with people's material conditions of existence in any sense, you know. The, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, and, 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 and any sort of practical or theoretical sense at all. It was just looking for 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 liberal rights, um, the citizenship rights, and uh, it that that's basically what it was about. So it was limited to that extent, you know. But then civil rights movements are limited to that extent, or or traditional movements about fighting for rights very limited because it doesn't actually look at the the holistic view of people's lives in terms of class and et cetera, et cetera. The um, what else did it do? I mean, I, I think it you know it had a it, it, it had a great effect. It it gave confidence. It, I I think this you know what I wouldn't be an expert on this at all. But I mean, I think it gave great confidence to organizations like Women's Liberation, like uh, Gay Rights, mm. all those organizations. It gave them confidence to fight for what they considered to be their rights. You know, because really, in a sense, that's what the sixties was about mm. too. You know. Yeah internationally, you know, in an internationalist perspective. And I think to this very day that the civil rights movement in the north of Ireland has had that effect on 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 communities and on movements, radical movements, people that are looking to, for social change. I think it had given them an inspiration and give them a freedom, it give them an airing, give them a belief in themselves, I think. Um, apart from the sort of material reforms and that which mm. happened, in that right. aesthetic way and in that abstract way I think it had that effect too you know um, Gavin and I think it has to this very day I mean it's quite remarkable when you go to the that Shag Lesby Shah's photographs up there too Shag Lesby has organised the uh, the gay rights mar march in Derry every year you know and the crowds that attend that are phenomenal you know thousands of thousands of people you know mm -hmm. And uh, and um, and the meeting in the Guildhall Square afterwards. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, there is a bit remarkable like that, you know. And there, I have to say this, and uh, and uh, I think it should be said, you know. I think even McCann's personality, his abilities, his internationalism, to some extent, has had a powerful effect in this town over the last forty years. You know, that is the truth. Yeah. The one other thing which is very important is that there was a rule in the Citizens Action Committee that we were not political, formally political, Gavin. And I remember John Hume coming to me, John, saying we're thinking of putting Claude and myself and Ivan Cooper up to fight the election. And I remember saying, well, John, the rule was that we were not political formally and this, etc., etc., etc. But... They stood for the elections. I even uh, won mid Derry, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it? yeah. So they says they didn't want to make it political. Why did they make that decision? For well, them? a lot of people would say it was opportunistic, you know, mm. uh, and it certainly looks like it. It certainly looks like it, you know. Um, they had got their name through the Citizens Action Committee mm. and a cause which was seen as a very noble cause, you know, which is a good CV for anyone fighting an election. So uh, people would have thought it was very opportunistic. I thought it was opportunistic. Mm. Yeah, I did. And uh, I didn't maybe like the way the Citizens Action Committee was used as a launching pad. Not for their, yeah, for their, for their political ambitions. Yeah. Just one more thing. You know the way you say history is written by the victors? Do you think it? I, I, when I was at school, and all, I always thought it was we were we were being taught John Hume's version yeah. of the civil rights movement. You no, know, because he, he he later went on to become Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. So I think it. I I always thought John John Hume was the only person. Yeah. And do you think that's? I think outside his own political space, mm. and the way he looks at the world. Is a very decent fellow, John, mm. and is that is done a lot of good, you know, and mm -hmm. set his own political space, you know. That's like Eddie McAteer, you know. Eddie, when he was leader of the Nationalist Party and fought for, fought for years against unionism, mm. you know, inside his own politics, mm. he was, uh, he, he was, he was, a, he was a wonderful man. Um, but his politics wouldn't have been my politics, mm. or John Hume's politics wouldn't have been my politics. With all the good work that John did, you know, and um, 
Of course, yeah. History, history always mm. takes a side, you know, because yeah. it's that's that's the liberal class that, <laughs> that write the history books. Of, 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 whose, whose books are listened to more or read more? Um, the 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 civil rights movement in the north of Ireland emanated directly from street radical activity, from the likes of McCann, Willie Breslin, Charlie Morris, and Bryn Hines, Kathy Harkin. Uh, a peep, peep, and and lots of other and Mrs. Bond, and her husband Johnny Bond, those were the street radicals. The yeah. civil rights yes, movement. Well. They started the civil rights movement. It was them that challenged the state, and started the civil rights movement. Myself, Eamon, Eamon the Lock, Van Barrow all mm -hmm. those people, and I, I must say, Ivan Cooper to a large extent too, because I've Ivan always worked hard and. Uh, and showed a lot of courage in his politics too, you know. But uh, it was the radicals that that were the civil rights movement mm. that that provided the that provided the launching pad for the civil rights movement, you know. And uh, the truth of the matter is, of course, that most a lot of people, a lot of people in the Citizens Action Committee, would not have been stuck in the street and pulling caravans across the street etc and uh, breaking houses breaking windows and houses they put families in mm. uh, and that's the sort of stuff that was done and that's that's what started built the political consciousness in this town and that's what created the space for mm. courage from people to do things that, uh, that were the right thing to do but we're not seen it may have been 10 years before that seen as very 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 unacceptable. I wouldn't be a man for being very s certain about anything, you know, we'd mm. have to think about things a lot. Right. And nothing comes easy for me. <laughs> you know. But uh, again, but apart from that, again, there are things which you know is right and there's things which you know is wrong, you know. Mm. And uh, I know for a fact that the radical class in Derry, when they went on the street during the 60s, you know, during before 68, uh, we did the right thing great and I know that the left wing of the old Dairy Labour Party were very important too you know and um, there's a continuum between the two you know mm. you know yeah do you have enough for what you said do you want to say anything else um, no I, I, I just uh, I, 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 well I mean you know I just sort of the nature of the Northern Ireland state you know mm. determined the way lot over the years you know because it was um from the moment it was uh, it began in 1921-22, it, uh, it was looking over its shoulder, you know. Mm. And uh, one of the greatest enemies it has is m modernity. You know, as you can see when it talks about gay rights and mm. women's rights, etc. Um, it congeals into a, f a fierce f a fear, you know. It just can't deal with modernity at all, you know. Just sit in the north? In the north, yeah.